First is Mr. Andrew Reeves, who is the owner of Reeves Farms. Welcome and thank you for being here today. Yes. Nancy Horrigan is the owner of Horrigan's Dairy Farm. Welcome and thank you for coming this afternoon. And Mr. Tom DeMarie is the owner of DeMarie Fruit Farm. Thank you very much for being here. As is the custom of the committee, uh, we'll ask you to please stand and uh, be sworn in. Please, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the, tru the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please let the record reflect that the witness is answered in the affirmative. <coughs> Thank you. Again, we'll uh, have each panelist give their opening statement, and then we'll take some time to ask questions. Mr. Reeves, if you would start. Thank you. Thank you. Distinguished members of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform Subcommittee on Regulatory Affairs, Stimulus Oversight, and Government Spending. Thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. If I could interrupt, can you yeah. just move the microphone a little bit closer so everyone can hear your testimony? Is that any better? That's better. Thank you. Agriculture is the largest industry in New York. It may be the largest industry left in the United States. In order for agriculture to continue to thrive, there must be a streamlined process to bring seasonal temporary labor when necessary. The H-2A program is supposed to be a tool for the American farmers put in place by Congress to expedite a legal temporary workforce. This program is supposed to allow farmers to develop a good business plan which ensures a plentiful supply of top quality produce without having to worry about a workforce. All of their businesses are able to grow and shrink markets and production depending on demand. If a worker leaves for any reason, 10 others are always ready to fill the void immediately. These businesses are based on these variables. If you hire an American recruit for temporary labor, they will be looking for another job with benefits and full-time, not seasonal status. Once another opportunity becomes available, they leave or don't show up for work one day. As a result, you must spend an average of $650 per worker and begin a 10 to 12 week process to replace them with the H-2A program. The H-2A program should extend the same freedoms to American farmers as Congress originally intended. They should be able to expedite legal foreign workers after exhausting all legal, local employment opportunities and options in the existing state. If an H-2A certification has been granted in a neighboring state, this would mean neighboring states have a shortage of eligible farm workers. I believe to have me advertise in these neighboring states and continue the recruiting process throughout half the life cycle of my contract period is ridiculous. For my farm not to be able to ask for experience when hiring is ridiculous. For me not to be able to ask for production standards without a challenge from New York or the U.S. Department of Labor is ridiculous. Any other business would not and could not operate in the parameters now set by the present H-2A law. The next problem that needs changing with the program is the length of the process. We used to be able to send an application to the state in Chicago for processing at the same time. We now send out one to the state first, and once they finish the process, we then have the necessary order number to now move on to Chicago with a different form. Many times the state will approve something which the U.S. Department of Labor will reject. An example is work production standards. New York State will allow them, but the U.S. Department of Labor won't. They get rejected and thrown back where either an appeal is necessary or remove the standards and move on. If you appeal, you have an 82% success rate, which you have put your process behind schedule. If you choose to appeal, the U.S. Department of Labor will no longer certify your order within 30 days of your date of need. New York State will now let me advertise asking for a resume, but the U.S. Department of Labor says I can. After we have survived everything to this point, we now have to keep records of all applicants who have requested an interview or job. We must document this for future audits and accept all applicants throughout half the term of the work contract. Because the job posting goes on a national site, we're bombarded with applications such as a fishing camp cook with a degree in geography wanting to bop in and work for the month of May on his way to Alaska in June. He must know more about the free housing first. How about the family of Eastern Europeans asking if they can move the whole family here? How about the LPN wanting a job because she lost her license and needs a job? However, she won't work weekends. How about the lady from Manila? How about the kid from Auburn wanting a job loading? How about Burrow asking, what do I mean by resume? These are some of the examples of resumes I deal with. How about the PhD from California who lost his job and applied? Dr. Cool is his email handle. These are all lawsuits and possible litigations looming on the horizon because our present system encourages it. Now, if everything is fine, we have 30 days or less to finish the process. We now move from overnight replies from government to snail mail. Homeland Security claims to turn your petition request around in three or four days. This is not true. 
If you overnight your I-129 to California, they stamp it on the day they receive it or the day after. A received letter with the next day stamped on it comes to you after the check is cleared. Usually the process with no problems takes 12 to 14 days from beginning to end. We now have 15 to 18 days left. Under the old process, we could block scheduled groups when the order had a WAC number. Now we must wait until the acceptance comes. Next, we must pay for visas before we can schedule interviews. We must email a request to CSC in order to get permission to access a site to schedule interviews. This takes five days if you make no mistakes in the requesting process. If you make a mistake, you will be notified in five days of the mistake and you redo it. In five more days, you will receive access or another problem. The site lets you electronically schedule or just fill out a spreadsheet and email. I suggest email. The electronic system is on its third spreadsheet and if there's a specific problem, you'll receive a specific direction back with email schedule. With the electronic system, you'll receive an error list without a clue of where to begin. There are no directions as to how the new system works. You attempt to understand and operate it. If you fail or have a problem, forget it. You will receive an email answer which will never answer the question you asked. I had a problem with an order which 18 email, emails were not answered, 11 calls were not returned. One day during lunch, I found another CSC branch with names and numbers. A human resources manager from another division was able to make proper contact to their other division for me. He was amazed how it took four calls to resolve the issue, so we thought. When my workers interviewed, it still required a call to Nuevo Laredo Consulate to inform them the order scheduled and farm name were wrong. They, as usual, were very helpful. The next issue I have with the H-2A program is its adverse effects wage rate of 10.25 per hour. This is a 15% increase in labor costs from the program revamped during the past administration. The rate went up in these times from 10.16. This is an unrealistic wage for workers considered unskilled, not requiring any previous experience or work standards. We pay for visas, we pay for food, and travel both ways. We take workers to the store. We must guarantee that at least three quarters of the total hours in the contract. We must provide housing and utilities at no additional cost. No taxes or Social Security are deducted. Many portions of their jobs offer them an opportunity to earn even more when performing piecework. When your slower workers are guaranteed a minimum of 10.25 an hour for piecework, your faster workers may considerably more because your production minimum standards are based on the slower workers. This is a reason we quit growing green and yellow beans, reduce acreage on peas, quit growing snow peas, and wouldn't raise blueberries if they weren't organic and brought a higher price. Lack of consistency is my final complaint with the program. I can send an I-129 with only one copy and get an acceptance. I've had a customer do the same and he sent a re and he was sent a report an approval request and a copy to send another copy in $404 with another form or they may, may not be able to schedule appointments in a consulate. I have used production standards and have customers denied standards. I've been told to hire Puerto Ricans and I have asked them to interview or su submit a resume. I recently talked to a large orchard producer from Virginia. Their farm hires a 178 H2A workers. Last year they were forced to use a Puerto Rican labor force because of problems with the H-2A in Jamaica. I have the same labor reporting system as a grower. My vendor verified the orchard production was half last year of other years. This farmer was asking me if there's any way around the Puerto Rican labor situation. He said if he has to use Puerto Rican workers this year, he will have an auction. How can you expect to tell a business owner how he has to run his business? No other business suffers these restrictions. Now, I'll briefly review areas I believe need change. Bullet form is the easiest. Apply to state and U.S. Department of Labor at the same time. Allow standards and experience to be included in job requirements. Revamp the recruitment process. Why advertise in a state which already has been approved for H-2A workers? Reduce the recruitment period until the time the H-2A workers arrive on the farm. If the number of workers on an order are reduced because of referrals, these slots should remain open so the farmer can fall back on them if the referral workers don't work out or leave. Introduce a form of arbitration to resolve issues. Legal service attorneys constantly look for areas to litigate. The 30-day rule from the U.S. Department of Labor is not adequate. It encourages farmers to lie about their need date because the process cannot be completed in th excuse me, 30 days. Allow a farm to select where he gets his workforce. Every other business has that freedom. Speed up the Homeland Security process or make them tell the truth. The U.S. Department of Labor and Department of State believe in this three to four day turnaround. Reduce the wage to a realistic level. The Bush order was the best system thus far. Repair the mess created by the new interview scheduling procedure. If 
it was introduced before it was ready, and I guarantee it wasn't developed by CSC. They've always been a great company to work with. We must include the dairy industry. Ag jobs is a dead on arrival proposal. The change has been morphed into a bad deal for agriculture. Strive for more consistency across the board. State and U.S. Department of Labor, State Health Department, Homeland Security, Department of State. Let the H-2 workers pay their own visa fee. This is non-refundable, and they should have some skin in the game. I've aired my grievances and hope is able to shed some light on the problems of H-2A. Ag jobs is not the answer either. Labor unions and legal service groups have killed the good in this bill already. I will not endorse any program with amnesty attached. The Amnesty Act of 1987 was another example of it not working. The workers moved up the ladder and left the vacuum, which was filled with the millions of undocumented workers in the United States. Most of the workers I recruit once spent time illegally in the United States. I've convinced them to go back and enter the legal H-2A program. I've convinced not less than 10 farmers to convert to legal H-2A workers. These people should remain at the front of the line. What we now ask for is a program to be developed which will partner with today's agriculture industry and finally address the H-2A needs of our dairy industry also. We need to work this out together for the salvation of the industry this country was built with. Let's once and for all do this together once and do it right. Leave the unions and legal service ambulance chasers on the sidelines. We owe this to an industry already bombarded with new EPA and DEC regulations every year. We also have trace back food safety requirements whose costs are all the burden of the farmer presently. We're at a point of losing our producers if something isn't done. Washington needs to become proactive with this issue. Four different programs in three years are confusing. The lack of continuity necessary for agribusiness to develop and maintain a long-term business plan. Thank you very much for your time and the invitation. Thank you, Mr. Reeves. Mrs. Horgan. Thank you for inviting me to testify before you today. My name is Nancy Horrigan, and I'm a member of Onondaga County Farm Bureau and the Board of Directors of the New York Agricultural Land Trust. My husband, John, and I, and my son, Matt, work over five, about 8,000 acres of land in Onondaga County and operate a dairy farm. My family and I are proud of our farm and the time and hard work that we put into the operation to make it successful and to keep it growing. Our heritage and our roots are in the community and our farm. And we want to see this business succeed at what is our core mission, producing healthy local milk for our neighbors and fellow citizens of New York State. Our milk is sold to burn dairy, doesn't get much lo more local than that. But the family farm has changed significantly over the years. As we've had to grow in order to keep up with our escalating regulatory burdens, and a price received for our milk that is at the mercy of global market conditions, even though our cost factors are particularly influenced by being in a state like New York, where all businesses face an unreasonably high cost of taxes, energy and labor, and regulatory compliance. While I can and will expand upon some specific topics that are of concern to me, the single biggest point that I want to make at this hearing is that the amount of actual time that I and my family have to spend complying with various federal regulations and that has escalated to the point where I spend more time in an office on a computer and filing paperwork than I ever did working with the cows, the crops, and the personnel on the farm. Each and every day I spend filing paperwork to comply with various federal regulations and each and every new piece of paper I have to put up on my central posting area on the farm has a cost to it that is profound and can never be recouped. The cost is my time and my husband's time. No amount of cows or cropland added to the farm to ensure our financial stability <coughs> will enable us to recoup that time that we have to spend filing ever-increasing paperwork, paperwork with various agencies. I do not believe that each federal agency that, de that we deal with has a comprehensive understanding of what it is like to try to farm in this environment. I have to meet mandates from the U.S. Department of Labor, wage and hour paperwork, the Homeland Security Office, I-9 forms, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, conservation and sanitation issues, the U.S. Department of Transportation, DOT truck numbers, hours of service regulations, the EPA for nutrient management issues, as well as the various state com 
compliance issues. While President Obama discussed this issue in his State of the Union speech in January, I can tell you that on the farm itself, we have not felt much of, an, much of any impact from a lessening of governmental regulations and paperwork. Clearly, we need to have government engaged in ensuring safety for consumers in the food they purchase, the roads they travel on, and the environment. However, the current emphasis on simply putting more and more regulations and paperwork on farms and small businesses like mine is out of control. I will never regain the time I lost and continue to lose in making sure that I am complying with everything that I have to file. So how can the federal government help New York State farm families like myself? First and foremost, just stop imposing new mandates. Follow the spirit of the Regulatory Review Commission that President Obama discussed and actually implement the recommendations to reduce the amount of time that I spend filing paperwork. Secondly, I would also like to suggest that the federal government ramp up its activity in redirecting farmland protection dollars to New York State. As stated, I serve on the board of directors of the New York Agricultural Land Trust. It is clear to me that with the vulnerability of New York's farmland to development made more acute by the barriers placed on farmers by the cost of complying with regulatory mandates, the existing funds from the United States Department of Agriculture have not been directed to New York State as they have been to other states. Where farmland is not so acutely in danger of being lost to parking lots and housing developments. When farmland is conserved in the local community, not only does the land provide wildlife habitat and improved water quality, it also ensures that a locally produced food supply is secured and a family farm can remain with the land. I would strongly suggest that the formula that drives the allocation of funds to the various states be reviewed with an eye towards ensuring that farmland that is particularly vulnerable, especially on Long Island in the city of Syracuse and the Hudson River, receive a priority. Thirdly, I would like to discuss one issue with the EPA that has me very concerned because of the precedent-setting nature of the agency's actions. A section of Onondaga County is located in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. My farm is not located within that watershed, but the issue is very important to me as my family is connected to other farm families who are in the watershed and rely on our farm to provide cow feed and to do custom work and planting for them. And that allows their farms to prosper and grow. While I am certainly not opposed to improve to improving water quality in the Chesapeake Bay, it strikes me as odd that all the environmental stewardship practices that I have put in place on my farm and other neighbors have put on their farm were not originally recognized in the EPA's overly zealous desire to clean up the bay by imposing strict regulations on agriculture. On my farm alone, we have spent tens of thousands of dollars constructing a nutrient management storage facility, and we are a partner in a community digester whereby waste from our farm and several other farms will help generate energy for county facilities. As a family farmer, I and my neighbors care about the environment that we leave for our children. We are not going to tolerate sloppy behavior, nor are we going to fail to do what is right on our farms to protect the environment, even when such practices are expensive to implement and are not paid for by the consumer dollar. However, the EPA's overreach on this issue is frightening to me and my fellow farmers, as with one single, single regulation originally proposed in the draft TMDL, the EPA was willing to sacrifice over 900 farms in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. I am pleased that the state DEC and EPA in consultation with New York Farm Bureau and others came to an agreement to accept New York's watershed implementation plan, but I realize this plan may still impose significant regulatory burdens on some smaller family farms. So I need to urge you to continue to work for conservation dollars in the next farm bill cycle for the on-the-farm environmental stewardship measures. But the main point I want to make is that knowing that the federal government can act this precipitously and unfairly and jeopardize my own and my neighbor's farm operation by issuing one poorly thought out regulation makes me lose sleep at night. 
and question the long-term ability of my family to keep our farm in operation for the next generation. The last issue I want to discuss, discuss is the need for a realistic and not clogged with paperwork guest worker program that you've already heard about from <coughs> Mr. Reeves. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today and present testimony. From the farmer's perspective, perspective of the serious and ever-increasing federal barriers to growth. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me and your consideration of my own time as a farm family business in New York State to try to reduce the time I spend in compliance costs. Thank you very much. Mr. Jean Marie. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. I appreciate being given the opportunity to discuss Apple industry labor concerns. Thank you for your attention. I am Tom DeMarie, and I own and operate a 200-acre fruit farm in the town of Williamson, Wayne County. I'm also the current president of the New York State Port Society and a past board member of the New York Apple Growers Association. We grow over 100,000 100, bushel of apples, as well as processing peaches and a few other stone fruits. We also own and operate cold storage on our farm. Six people work full-time or part-time on our farm, and an additional 29 people depend on the seasonal work available through our farm to support their families. According to the New York State Orchard Survey, over 42,000 commercial acres of apples in the state. In the past 20 years, growers have renewed this acreage at about 3% to 4% a year. More than 65% of the New York apple acreage is in the seven counties on the south shore of Lake Ontario. In the past four years, most of the fresh apple growers in these counties have been replanting at a rate of 500 to 1,300 trees per acre, which costs between $6,500 and $13,000 an acre. This means that apple growers in these counties over the past four years have invested around $46 million in new apple orchards alone. Twice this amount is likely to have been invested on on-farm machinery, equipment, labor housing, and other real estate improvements, as well as apple storages, packing lines, and other cooperative marketing facilities over the same period. Our own operation has invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in capital improvements over the past four years. We spend over $5,000 an acre annually growing, harvesting, and delivering our fruit, 80% of which benefits the local economy. This is our sixth year using the H2A program. Securing H2A labor is expensive and increasingly fraught with government red tape and stress. The U.S. Department of Labor and the New York State Department of Labor in Albany are attempting to make this program so difficult that no one will choose to use it. <coughs> Growers, however, have almost no choice but to use this program if they wish to secure legal employees skilled enough to perform the required work efficiently on the t and on time. The Labor Department tells the growers what they must put on their work orders, limiting the experience requirements, requiring employers to tolerate employees missing up to five consecutive days of work without notifying the employer in advance. <coughs> How are growers supposed to harvest each apple variety at an optimum quality when the workers can miss work without notifying the employer. The Department of Labor in Albany has also been uh, requiring referral refers to Puerto Ricans to be interviewed within 10 days, when these referred persons often have no experience working at a fruit farm. Growers should not have to argue with or petition DOL employees with no practical experience in operating a fruit farm about the experience required for fruit farm employees in a business brought producing perishable crops. Thousands of dollars were lost in New York fruit farms and their local economies last year because of delays in securing farm labor. Fruit was picked late and at a lower quality, plus a lower value. The failures of secure labor or the loss of skilled labor during a critical Planting, crop protection, or harvesting operation results in financial losses that are not only jeopardize the farm business, but also the local economy. Losses in apple quality jeopardize both year-round and part-time employees' income. 
Fruit growers need employees familiar with their particular varieties and the market requirements those farms are attempting to meet to secure the best possible price for each variety of fruit. Fruit growers do not want to train new employees annually. They want to retrain, retain trained employees. Untrained employees make an expensive mistakes that today's businesses cannot afford. Workers also prefer to work with the same farm year after year. As time goes on, there are fewer skilled people who are willing to move from place to place every six to ten weeks to harvest crops as they mature. Given a choice, most people would prefer to earn a living in one place, clean and dry environment that does not require continuous physical labor. I know that these issues are difficult and controversial at times, but growers must have some assurance that they will have a consistent skilled labor workforce available to them that will be willing to retain trained workers. Congressman Slaughter has been recently working as a strong advocate on behalf of growers and contacting the Labor Department <coughs> to solve some of these problems. I would urge you to contact your office to work with her to get the uh, H-2A program to be more responsive to their needs. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, and thank you to all of our panelists. I sit here and I listen to your testimonies, and I shake my head and I wonder, how did we get to this point where you're subject to both the state as well as the federal regulations? And I want you to know that we, we're sympathetic here and we'd like to work with you. The, the issue that is recurring and recurring, and I hear it from uh, both the agriculture as well as the dairy industry, is this H-2A program. And I would like to uh, ask all of you if you, in, if you could imagine what the perfect H-2A program would look like, if you could tell us what that would mean to you and what, what would an ideal H-2A program look like? To me, it would be um, able to, at the same time, apply to the state and the federal government, same form, they virtually ask for the same information. Uh, it's a federal program, so I think the federal uh, Department of Labor, the U.S. Department of Labor, should supersede anything regulated by New York State. Uh, and at the same time, uh, Homeland Security would be your next step. If the process takes 12 to 14 days, then let's let's give more than 30 days to process from beginning to end and uh, not lie about it. What I have to do, and I, I shouldn't say this, but I'll tell you what I have to do. If I need workers on the 1st of March, I have to turn around and say that I need them on the uh, middle of February, 1st of February, because if everything goes well, I, there's no way with the new system from the time I get a certification out of Chicago to the time I interview my workers that I can do in 30 days. And in my presentation, you'll see a day breakdown on it. It's going to take 12, 14 days for Homeland Security. I'm going to spend the next five days. This is if I'm sitting in my chair, and as soon as I get a notification, I'm on the computer and going to work with uh, scheduling appointments. You know, there's no day in between. It's overnight and stuff, everything else. So the next thing I do is I go to CSC that day and say, hey, I want to be able to schedule appointments. So what do they do? Five days later, if I ask them properly, you know, if I miss one number or something like that, in five days they'll tell me, hey, you missed a number. So then I redo it again with the number, and then in five days they'll say, okay, now you can schedule. What I need is top to bottom is a program developed with the farmer's input. The people that have to work with it, that have to make it work, we're left away from the table. I went to a seminar in uh, December in Atlanta on the new program. The guy that developed this new program for Department of State didn't want to hear anything from anyone. This was his deal, he knew what he was doing, and this is the way all the concepts are going to be. And, and to sit there in a room, we had State, we had Homeland Security there, we had Department of Labor there, the representatives of the consulates, and Department of State and uh, Department of Labor couldn't believe it. Well, I stood up and said, what do you mean it takes three or four days for Homeland Security to process? It takes 12 days to two weeks. And here's two federal uh, branches that said, no, it doesn't. It's three to four days. I said, they cheat on their stamp on the form. That's how it's three to four days. 
but it's a 12 to 14 day process and you've got two federal agencies that are all working together with this that are unaware of it. You mentioned in your testimony about the Bush administration, was there a different set of standards and now it's changed? You mentioned you were at a conference about the change? The, uh, the changes. Three days before President Bush left office, he did an executive order that changed H to A. He rolled back the wage. He, there were some pluses and minuses to it, but it still was the best program yet. He streamlined the um, referrals. When you have to advertise take applications, he made it where when they hit your farm, you don't have to take any more applications and uh, keep a record of them because all this period of time, like 75 days up to that point, his administration felt was adequate time to look for referrals in U.S. workers. And uh, that was changed, actually, that was changed three days before he left office. And there's been three other changes back and forth since that one. So in three years, we've had four changes. And, and the funny thing is, if you're a farmer, how do you turn around and uh, say, well, I'm going to H2A this year, but what's the law going to be? When I was down in Atlanta in December, the only thing we were handed out is the agenda for the meeting. There was not any handout. The program south of the border had changed. The forms north of the border had changed. Not one agent or farmer was given anything but the agenda for the meeting because here it was December 6th, and they didn't have this program ready to launch January 1. But yet, January 10th, it took effect. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Have you received any specifics since the January 10th implementation? No, it's, my brothers will tell you that I've lived in, in my living room on a computer trying to find rules and regulations on where, where do I get the spreadsheet, how do I get the spreadsheet. The first, the spreadsheet, had, uh, it's on its third copy now. The first one, I wanted to schedule 22 workers, and I, I called CSC and said, your spreadsheet won't work. It's not formatted properly to take more than uh, 17 workers, because five of the 22 that it would take were formatted properly. They told me, you don't know what you're talking about, cut and paste, and come right down through the country uh, names that they had there. So I cut and paste 33 on there and did it electronically, and it crashed in the system, and and it took it took 18 emails, 11 calls, and the problem was they said, well, once the system ate them up, we can't sort them out. And uh, so this was a, a two and a half week process. It should have been three days, and but at least now they they have a spreadsheet that pretty much working. And, but it's the third one since January. Thank you. Um, I'm way over my five minutes. Mr. Kelly, I'll yield to you. Thank you, Ms. Burkle. I mean, you, you can take as much time as you want. Really, we need to, to hear you for as long as you want to go because I know how frustrating it is. Um, and, and I'm trying to understand, and, and I'm going to ask Ms. Oregon, uh, what's the reason for the EPA? Is there anybody finding anything that the EPA does that makes sense to any of us? Now, we all have state DEPs. That, you should have the primacy over how that state. I would like to think that the local folks know a lot more about what the local issues are than somebody in Washington, D.C. that's never been here and doesn't understand what it is that you do, that any of you do. So if you can't, I mean, this, this EPA issue is huge. It is huge. I mean, it's shutting down America as we go across the board. And I'm not just talking. I just wish, listen, I wish we could tell you that it's only in agriculture. I spent two days with health care providers. Their problem is they can't see any reason to stay in the business. You talk to people in the banking business, the regulations are so onerous, they're afraid to lend money to anybody because they don't know who's going to come in and shut them down. And then if this is the United States of America, and we're more worried about internal conflict and internal uh, regulation than outside, I mean, we've got a real problem. But tell me on this EPA thing, because this is absolutely incredible, and I don't think the American public has any idea what you go through. You know what, they, they ride down the interstate and they see these beautiful farms and say, God, I'd love to do that. That's got to be fun. But just some listening to you folks. I mean, at some point, there's an old saying, don't worry about the mule, just load the wagon. I think the mule's about ready to unhitch himself. The only thing I can say, all three of us here, we do what we do because um, we just like to be farmers, bottom line. And we've just all been pulled away from what we like to do because of all these regulations and the paperwork. And I'm sure his brothers are really ticked at him a little bit because he's not out there with them physically with the people who are working, and uh, 
I'm sure hoping you're listening and you can find answers for us because I certainly don't understand it all. It's just evolved in the last 10 to 20 years to such a <clears throat> such a critical mass of paperwork and regulations. And we're just not let, we just can't farm anymore. Let me ask you something because Ms. Burke will ask this question all the time. If you knew then what you knew now, would you be doing what you're doing? Well, you can see I'm not the youngest one here. I'm me either. And <laughs> we're starting to question if this is any fun anymore. And when my husband says it's not any fun anymore to farm, that's serious. Well, that's a key phrase that I've heard from more farmers in the last two or three years. And my brothers and I say the same thing. The fun is out of agriculture. I mean, it used to be with a seasonal business you could go on vacation in the winter or there, there is none of this any longer. You're, you're just bogged down with regulations. You're bogged. We had DEC the other day with going through the DEC audit, and that's that's an, another deal. It's necessary, you know. It's an absolute necessary thing, but also a lot of the regulations that they're requiring out of you are absolutely absurd. And uh, you know, on your sprayer, you've got to have a label in a bag on the sprayer. Not in, only in the cab, because if you drive across the road in a car or something hits you, they have to be able to see what's in that tank. And But every time they're telling you about these regulations and these changes, they're also reminding you what the fine's going to be if you don't do it. And uh, it, they seem more fine-oriented than they are production-oriented. And that, that's <coughs> difficult for the agricultural mind to understand. We're not into... Uh, do this or you're going to get fined. We're into let's take the proactive approach and let's get this done. I, I think there's uh, an awful lot of regulation coming both from Washington and New York State combined. doesn't matter which government you're referring to. Um, I've been in the business 30 years. 30 years ago we could, we could farm and not necessarily do anything that we're doing differently than what we are today. But we have to certify, we have to fill out forms, we have to follow regulations. That isn't changing anything that we're really truly doing other than we're spending time filling out forms to tell somebody else in Albany or Washington what it is that we're doing. And it's the same practices, the same things that we're doing. We're not, we're not doing anything different. We aren't improving anything. There's no improvements to our fruit there's, or dairy or, or vegetables or whatever. But we're just having to spend more and more and more of my time, my wife's time, in following paperwork, following rules, doing things, doing things that somebody else says that we have to do that isn't changing anything, isn't improving how the fruit is grown, how the vegetables are grown, or how the milk is produced. It isn't different. It's all been the same, and it hasn't changed in 30 years. It's the same. And yet we're spending, I'm spending 10 hours a week just doing forms and reading new rules and regulations. Albany just came down with a new set of rules that you have to follow a new form every time that there's a change in an employee status. If an employee works, has a work agreement with us that says they're going to work 45 hours. You worked 48 hours last week. I have to get a new paperwork and fill out a new form because his hours changed. That's how crazy the system has gotten to be because somewhere along the line there's some, somebody got taken advantage of. Probably, I won't say that isn't, isn't good or isn't the way that it should be, but when you start making everybody try to solve problems because of one incident, the world is going to come to a stop because you can't regulate everything, every problem, every issue out of reality. So, well, I, I, I appreciate your testimony because I, I find it absolutely intriguing that a business that runs somewhere between a trillion three and a trillion five a year in the red has the audacity to come in and tell you how to run your business. You haven't talked to anything. <laughs> My question really comes down to, have any of these people that come in and set the bar, and ask the last group this, people that set the standards, have any of them ever actually done anything in agriculture? I mean, actually been in farming? No, no, absolutely not. Okay, so there's, this is a no, software program that somebody puts on their, their laptop and tells you what you're going to do. Absolutely. And, it, and as was said a few minutes ago, the H-2A program that we're using to have labor that's legal, 
and that I can sleep at night knowing that I'll have a workforce there tomorrow that ICE isn't going to come in and take them away because I thought they were legal. They showed me documents that I determined to be legal, but they weren't. They can come in and take my workforce away and my prop will fall on the ground and I'll have no, no recourse. And this, this is the program I'm using so I can sleep at night knowing that I can get a crop pick of, of apples. And yet, we have all kinds of problems trying to secure a legal workforce. And nobody wants to hear, when you try to talk to somebody, as what's been said, nobody wants to hear what your problem is. Absolutely nobody wants to hear what your problem is. They know better than the agencies that you're dealing with than what I do when I'm trying to do my job. And that's a very, very frustrating thing. And I, I, we spend more time right now on organizations and tell from the people that are sitting here. We spend a lot of time in organizations trying to trying just to keep a toe in the door and trying to keep some of this regulations at bay and nobody wants to hear us. So do you ever have an audience with any of these folks, this alphabet soup of people that show up, whether it's EPA, the, the DEP, whoever it is, any of them ever give you the audience to sit down and discuss with you what your problems are and what the common fixes would be from the people that actually do it? No. So other than saying Ms. Burkle and myself, you really wouldn't have a chance to talk to a government that pretty much dictates how you're going to run your business? We, I've, I've been to Washington in the last Congress, and, and the organization that I'm the president of has been to Washington this year, and I've been there last year and, and talked about these same issues, and this is just a the same thing over and over and over again. We, we keep asking for relief and don't get anywhere. Every time, virtually every time they make a program different, they make it more difficult. They don't make it easier, they make it more difficult. No. Because they have, the, the mindset is is that we're going to put, that we're going to reduce the unemployment rate. So we're not going to allow foreign nationals to come in and work in this country. That's, that's the mindset of what's going on with this program. That's where the whole problem with this program is. Is that the mindset is, is we don't want this program because we want to put U.S. citizens to work. My business and everybody's business is a short window of time that we need people. I can't hire somebody for six to eight weeks or ten weeks, put on 30 employees for eight to ten weeks, and then tell them that they can't work anymore because I don't have anything else for them to do. There's, who's who's going to come and work for me for ten weeks, work 40 to 50 hours a week, depending on how the week goes, and then tell them at the end of the eight to ten weeks, well, I'm sorry, I don't have any more work for you. Where do they go? What do they do? How do I hire somebody that's only going to work for me for eight to ten weeks a year? That's my business. That's what I'm in. And that's what I have to face. And that's why this program gives me that opportunity to try to bring somebody in that isn't out of a country that has people that are willing to work. And yet nobody wants to seem to help us make that system work at least reasonably well for us. Thank you. Food safety is a big issue. And um, we're deep into the food safety with daily deliveries, fresh produce all the while. And uh, fortunately this year, thank you, um, we were able to get 100% return workers from Mexico. What this does, and people don't understand it, the U.S. Department of Labor state doesn't, this is critical because our food safety program has standards. Everything we harvest in the field has a written standard that has to be followed and inspected twice a year. Our workers return, they know the standard. It's the same thing. They follow the procedure. We go through the inspections. We do a great job of food safety. This is why it's critical to have continuity in your workforce. And I have to, I mean, imagine having the same workers as last year and have to dump or jump through all these hoops to try and get them back and hope that you get them back. And it's all tied in with everything else. The food safety issue, uh, life, wildlife. I have to monitor wildlife in our fields on a daily basis and keep a log. If I see a goose, I have to document where I saw it and how I chased it off. Same with the deer. <laughs> this is the safety, re these are the food safety requirements that Walmart, Price Chopper, and Whiteman's, and it's good. They're looking out for the consumer, and we don't mind that. But there has to be somewhere, someone on our side. And a, and a lot of it's our own fault. I, th I think labor, myself, is the biggest issue in agriculture. Number two is perception. And you know, the news media is as guilty as anyone else. Look at an agricultural commercial on television. 
Green Giant, and here's five guys picking sweet corn in peach boxes. Here's a Stolfer's commercial. I think it's Stolfer's. Here's a guy growing peppers, and the other side of the fence is a dairy farm. Now, isn't that ridiculous? You can't have that anywhere near anything. And, and we tolerate it. We pick right. Here's a company that's owned by a farmer. He's got an old John Deere 430 cultivating in the field and says, that's my business manager as soon as he gets finished plowing. I wrote him a letter stating, this is bad for agriculture. We're high tech. We're an industry, an industry to be reckoned with. We've got to stop this. He sent me a, a certificate for a 12-ounce bag of frozen veggies. <laughs> but, but we are our own worst enemy. We are high tech. I'm proud of what I do for a living. I worked in industry. Nothing is as challenging as agriculture is. You do all this and you deal with the weather besides. We need to do a better job of advertising the technology in our business, the education it takes to run a business like this and run it successfully, and we need to pound it into the media also. Get out there on a the farm and do a story. Follow through one of these audits in the field on food safety. Look at what we're doing in agriculture, and we should not any longer tolerate these commercials that degrade agriculture and the farmers and make us look like a bunch of country hicks because no one is going to be successful in farming any longer if they don't have an education and they don't have uh, the ability to put two and two together and take a proactive approach for the future. I would just say ditto. That's exactly, I mean it is exactly how so many of us feel in ag agriculture today that we're um, the Green Acres generation back with the pitchforks and the bib overalls and riding around, you know, and that's that's the perception that we work against in, well, the media, but also in, in the regulatory agencies that we deal with, is that the mindset is, is that agriculture in this country is run by a bunch of hillbillies. Pardon the reference to anybody that takes offense to it, but that's exactly how there, it's it's felt that when, as I said in my statement, when somebody else sitting at a desk in Albany or in Washington can tell me how to fill out and what I have to put in my work order and what the work order can and cannot have in it, and is telling me that my business will operate because of what this work order has in it, how am I going to survive? I can tell you today that the generation that's working my farm is the last generation that's going to work that farm. And I'll end by saying, and I told you our milk is sold to Burn Dairy, which is a local business. I'm really glad these two guys are still in business, because I appreciate local food. And I'm glad to know where it's coming from and how it's produced. And I hope all the rest of you do the same. Well, I'm just going to finish up. I'm going to turn back the throat. Keep your passion and don't give it up, because I'm telling you, the way we'll fix it is by staying on message and not getting distracted. I know it's hard to do. And I know that every day you wonder why I keep doing this and how much longer can I do it. But just keep in mind, if we don't get it fixed here, there's no other place in the world it can be fixed. So let's just make sure we all stay on target and we'll get, we'll get this fixed. But it's going to take a lot of fight from all of us. So thank you for being here. I appreciate your bravery for being here and taking the time out of what you do every day to spend it with us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Kelly. And I would like to thank all of you as well. I, too, would like to echo uh, Mr. Kelly's comments. If you quit, they win. And so this is about preserving all that you've worked for. We want you to know how much we appreciate your efforts uh, in, for you to be here today and to take time out from your busy schedules. We'd like to work with you. We'd like to continue this dialogue. We'd like to take your message to Washington, which we will. I failed to introduce, we have members here from the Oversight Government Reform staff, so they're listening and working with us as well. So we will take this message to Washington. It won't stop here in this room. We want to uh, encourage you and uh, please work with us and dialogue with us and let's continue uh, to get this job done. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time.